This was the flock, racing homers, thoroughbreds of the sky. Of all the many pigeon breeds, the swiftest, strongest, the most intelligent. Altogether, there were 30 birds in the flock, an average number for an average loft. Like racehorses, racing homers follow a regular training schedule, and this was their afternoon exercise flight. Here amid the familiar landmarks of home, their flight pattern was a long, sweeping ellipse, and in the center, a powerful magnet that held them always in orbit. That magnet was their loft. The daily routine never varied. After an hour of flying, feeding time, and as usual, Brown Bob led the others in. The loft had three separate sections. For each section, there was an entrance, or trap equipped with a one-way gate. This was Eve, a brood hen, ready now to take her turn in the nesting bowl. Her mate, Adam, had been sitting for more than eight hours, but that was according to pigeon rule. The male always broods by day, and the female by night. And there are always just two eggs in a clutch. Eve's first egg had hatched right on time, and the peeper was doing well. The second egg, long overdue, was just now beginning to show signs of life. In the warm light of day, the peeper's baby fuzz dried and fluffed out. But Eve had mothered many broods. In her crop, the supply of pigeon milk was running low, so the latecomer got barely enough to keep it alive. Then, Eve turned back to her firstborn. Despite a dwindling ration, Peeper number two somehow survived, and in due time, its eyes opened. The first thing it saw was the boy. Chad Smith was the owner of the flock, and right now, he was worried. He'd heard about cases like this, where an older mother will let one peeper starve to ensure the survival of the other. It was happening here, all right. The difference in size proved the point beyond a doubt. Perhaps she would feed the weakling if it were alone. But Eve had disowned her own. Well, the book said, cull the weak. It wouldn't be easy, but the peeper would starve anyway. Why let it suffer? Chad knew all about suffering, but this was his first experience as an executioner. I felt weak inside, but a breeder must follow the code. Only the fit may survive. Only the fit? But where would he be if that rule applied to him? Weren't they both in the same boat? Suppose he broke the rule just for once, gave the little pigeon a chance, hand raised her as a pet. By golly, it might just work. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, raising a peeper away from the loft has its problems. The first Chad solved with a mash of ground oats and cow's milk. And to keep the peeper warm, he found a perfect brooder. Even had a built-in temperature control. But even the most understanding mother must draw the line somewhere. Mrs. Smith preferred a different kind of poultry in her pan. She was a school teacher, widowed by the late war, and Chad was her only child. She encouraged his hobby, and in fact had become quite an authority on pigeons herself. As time passed, the little peeper thrived and soon became a squeaker. Now her pin feathers became feather tops that hinted at the future coloring of her plumage. Between his pet and his pigeon loft, Chad kept pretty busy. And on the surface, he seemed a well-adjusted boy who wore his handicap well. But he couldn't avoid this daily reminder that he hadn't always been tied to a wheelchair. In fact, the fellas still said Chad was the best ball player they ever had. Chad could never figure out why this had to happen to him. But well, there must be a million fellows who played ball every year and never got hurt. But it did happen. And this was just the way it happened. Chad had hit a line drive over second base, too. Rounded the corner, sprinted to third. Only when he slid in, he didn't get up. Temporary injury to a spinal nerve, the doctor said. After six months, he told Chad he was cured. Only saying it didn't make it so. Well, here he was, a year later, still stuck in the chair. And so Chad turned from baseball to pigeons and soon became devoted to his new hobby. Here, at least, he found a measure of freedom on the wings of his flock. But a measure of freedom wasn't enough. Chad wanted more from his birds. He wanted his legs. And these green aluminum bands were his tickets to the future. Each band entered a squeaker in a race called the Futurity. It would be run in the fall. If he could win the first prize, a thousand dollars, he had a secret plan. He would travel to a world famous clinic he heard about, and there he would be cured. He picked four likely candidates still had one band left over. A band and a bird. Not much of a bird, to be sure. But who could tell? After all, she came from a good line. Besides, he promised to give her a chance. She was going to have it. And now that the squeaker was officially banded, she needed an official name for the record. But what would it be? There was nothing special about her. She was just a pigeon. Well, why not? Pigeon. Make it Pidge for short. Since Chad had gone this far, he had to take the next step. A racing homer must be trained to home to the lock. So Pidge was returned to the nesting bowl. She was as big as her brother now. Chad was sure that Eve would accept Pidge as her own and make no more trouble. 
And so he turned to the greater worry that was always with him. Under the loft, Chad had rigged a makeshift gymnasium. But the truth was, his problem was not physical, but mental. Fear of failure, the doctor said. He also said that Chad would never walk again until he overcame that fear by forgetting himself. But Chad couldn't forget. Until he found someone who could help him, he was determined to help himself. Now, Chad knew a lot about pigeons, but one thing he didn't know was that once a squeaker is rejected by its mother, it's almost never taken back. sight of a wounded squeaker enrages the flock. Instinctively, they will destroy it. Chad knew at once he'd made a mistake. The flock was after Pidge. Chad was puzzled. There wasn't a sign of trouble here. Every bird was the picture of innocence. And then he saw. If Pidge were to die, Chad would never forgive himself. It was all his fault. Chad, she'll be all right. It was plain, though, she must never be put back in the loft again. And so Chad built her a pen on the back porch. And here, in her private apartment, Pidge grew and thrived. Soon, she began to display her permanent markings. In the language of the pigeon fancier, she would be called a blue bar. As her feathers developed, so did Pidge's personality. At eight weeks, she was in full plumage and fully grown. Come on, Pidge. Through the passing days, the boy and the bird had found a common bond, their need for companionship. And between them, a warm, deep affection began to grow. Much of Chad's world was centered in Pidge, and all of hers in Chad. Pigeons learned to fly in about eight weeks. Lately, Pidge had been going through all the motions. And so, when she took off in full flight, Chad wasn't too surprised. Still, he figured he'd better keep an eye on her. She was headed straight for the neighbor's backyard. There was more than a spark of adventure in Pidge. But right now, it looked like it was going to be quenched. <laughs> Of course, a little ducking never hurt a healthy bird. But this could hardly be said of the neighbor's cat. And 
so Pidge learned an all-important lesson. Her one escape from danger lay in the swiftness of her wings. At four months, a racing pigeon must learn to home. And it was on the waterfront at the end of the pier that Chad tossed Pidge on her first training flight and into the first great adventure of her life. Pidge swept low and fast, soared high and free. And yet Pidge wasn't really free at all. She was still a homing pigeon, and already she was beginning to feel a need to find the boy. And almost at once, in the distance, she thought she saw him. something was wrong. This wasn't Chad, and certainly neither was this. Pidge was confused, but confident. The boy must be somewhere, and she would find him. Well, it was plain now the boy just wasn't here. So Pidge decided to pick up a hasty meal and then start looking for Chad somewhere else. Of course, all this time, Chad had been anxiously looking for Pidge. And he would keep on looking for her, just as long as there was any daylight left. Evening caught Pidge still at the farm, lost and lonely. She wanted to leave, but she didn't know where to go. Now it was too late. And so Pidge decided to take cover for the night and work out her problem in the morning. Pidge's eye caught a nesting box, a familiar shape, a reminder of home.
Chad hadn't slept very well that night, and with the morning, he gave up all hope. But as it turned out, just a few miles away, Pidge had found the safest place in town to spend the night. Now refreshed, she felt again the all-compelling urge to find the boy. The first thing she looked for was a vantage point, where she could collect herself and get her bearings. Well, that was hardly the place to gather one's wits. So next, she found a quiet patch of green. But she soon discovered it was more than a patch, and far from quiet. It was a bowling green. Pidge pushed on. If she could only spot a familiar face down there, in her brain was the image of a person. Instead, she found people. saw something familiar, something that belonged to the boy. But an invisible barrier thrust her away. By chance, her next excursion took her to the waterfront. This, too, seemed familiar, for it was where she last saw Chad. But the pier stood empty. The little park behind the beach seemed more inviting. Here at last was peace and quiet. From beneath her wing, Pidge picked up a random feather. It gave her a rare, coquettish look. Apparently, this caught the roving eye of Champ. Champ was a racing homer, too, lost from some distant loft. Now he'd made the park his home. He had not yet found a mate, and Pidge seemed unattached. So, in pigeon fashion, he proposed. and she refused. When pigeons mate, it's for life, and Pidge didn't want to be hasty. She would, however, accept Champ as her companion, and for the time being, she'd make this little park her home. In the weeks that followed, Chad tried to put Pidge out of his mind. The futurity was only two months away. He had four birds entered, and each day, he checked their physical condition. The wings were all important. One missing flight feather would put the bird out of the race, and the keel must be sound and well fleshed out. Now, the members of Chad's racing club 
were tossing his birds along with their own in long distance training flights. And of course, the greater the distance, the more birds were lost. Chad lost three. And that left only Big Red, son of Brown Bob, to carry all his hopes. He hated to take the chance, but he had to test Red in the training races. So he entered him in a 200 miler. Here at the club, the procedure is always the same. The owner pays an entry fee. Then each bird is banded with a special coated rubber leg band. Next, the owner is given a sealed precision time clock to be used at the end of the race when the bird returns to the loft. Finally, the entries are shipped to the starting point. In the 200 miler, Big Red got a good start. And he kept well up with the others all the way. Red home straight and true. He'd made excellent time, Chad was sure of it. But that didn't mean a thing until Red was caught and clocked in. Come on, boy. Get in there, Red. Get in the door, Red. Hurry. Hurry up! Hurry up! Get in there! Trapped. Good. Now get the band off the bird and into the clock as quickly as possible. Sealing the band in the capsule automatically starts the clock. From this data, plus the distance flown, the racing officials could now establish the speed of the bird and its final position in the race. In the 200 miler, Red took a first and won the $25 pool. It was early fall, just two weeks before the big futurity, when two vagabonds on the wing happened to pass over the loft, Pidge and the persistent Champ. The sight of home brought the tug of an old memory to Pidge's heart, and she had to investigate. Had Chad been on the porch that day, Pidge would surely have home to him. The next most familiar sight was the loft, and instinctively, she was drawn to it. This time, her entrance was quiet and uncontested. The flock accepted her as a mature bird, as indeed she was, mature and ready to choose a mate. It was plain that Big Red had already made his choice. But so had Champ. Champ had waited too long to give Pidge up now. Twist, a thrust, and Red was finished. Out of the battle and out of the race, Red had lost a flight feather. Now that the field was clear, Champ prepared to claim his own. He began the courtly mating ritual of the pigeon, and this time, 
Pidge did not refuse him. After the mating, the male always struts a bit to express his pride in this his ultimate conquest. And then he turns to more practical matters. He seeks a place where he can bring his mate to nest. He summons her with gentle coaxing. Pidge accepted his choice, just as she had accepted Champ as her lifelong mate. Pidge! Pidge! Hello, Pidge. Come on. To find each other again after all these months, brought a wonderful feeling of gladness to both the boy and the bird. Hello, Pidge. Where you been? You've been away. When Chad saw that Pidge had brought home a mate, he approved. He gave them a nesting bowl, which they would redecorate to their liking. With Champ and Pidge provided for, Chad began to look around for Big Red and found the flight feather. It could only be Red's, but it mustn't be. He wouldn't have a single entry left for the big race. There it was, one feather gone, two broken. As the days dragged by, Chad was convinced that now he would never walk again. Winning the futurity had been his hope, his dream. Now he was ready to give up pigeons and pigeon racing for good. His mother knew she must find some way to pull him out of his depression and she had the glimmer of an idea. It's said in the pigeon book that a pigeon's greatest urge to home is during the hatching period, for then it has a mate, a nest, and a brood to pull it back to the loft. Pidge was banded for the futurity, and once she laid her eggs, she'd have every reason in the world to hurry home. And there was also her love for the boy. And so, new hope. But first, Pidge had to solve the problem of the eggs. And she did. The second egg arrived just two days before the deadline for the race. Pidge was quite proud of herself, and no doubt would have preferred to remain quietly at home. Nevertheless, when the trailer trucks pulled out, on the 500-mile run to the starting point of the race, Pidge was in one of the cages. And with her went the prayers and plans of one small boy. The big futurity races always start in the early hours of the morning. And now, on the starting line, more than 7,000 entries were ready and waiting.
Nervously, the young birds refreshed themselves for the grueling flight ahead. The official seals were broken. The cage doors fastened with light yarn. Pidge was tense, expectant. The starter prepared for the count. One, two, three, go! Almost at once, smaller groups began to break off, each choosing a slightly different course. This was Pidge's group. So far, she'd been trailing, but now she was beginning to move up. miles from the starting point. Pidge had caught up with the others now and was keeping pace. In every race there are many hazards. About 20 out of every hundred birds never reach home. In Pidge's group, the law of averages took its inevitable toll. 150 miles out lay the domain of the hunter. But here, death is quick and merciful. There are other places where the end is far more tragic. In the heat of the day, the halfway point was reached. The birds were thirsty, and this looked like a refreshing pool of water. But it wasn't water. It was oil. To the west, toward the greener hills, the elements took their toll. Under the driving rain, some of the birds weakened and sought cover on the ground. But most of the flock carried on, and Pidge was one of them. At 350 miles, only one bird was ahead of her. And now she took the lead. When Pidge left the storm behind, she was alone. More than 400 miles had passed under her wings. Sure of her course now, Pidge would let nothing turn her from it.
and the pull of home was growing stronger and stronger. She had run the gauntlet. All the hazards had been overcome. All but one. The Peregrine Falcon. The strike was so sudden, Pidge knew only terror and confusion. The hawk tried again, missed again, then climbed for another attack. At 60 miles an hour, Pidge headed for the hills, but a falcon dives at 200. Pidge sought refuge in the brush. The falcon will not attack on the ground, so he tried to flush her, drive her into the air again. When the hawk failed again to flush her, he gave up. Pidge gathered all her waning strength. Even beyond her physical pain, there was the all-compelling need for home. A last mountain range, and then the fog-shrouded pass that led to home. It was the city, her city. The loft would not be far away. Chad was so excited, he never noticed the broken beat of Pidge's wings. He was sure she'd made good time. Now to clock her in. Come on. Come on, Pidge. Pidge! Chad, you're walking. 
he had thought only of Pidge, he had forgotten himself. And so it didn't really matter if Pidge didn't win the big race or the $1,000 prize. Through Chad's love for her, he got the prize he wanted anyway. And so the day he thought would never come, did come. And as he stood upon the hill and tossed Pidge and her youngsters to the wind, he looked out across the world and into the future, a bright and wonderful future, and all because of a little pigeon that worked a miracle.